All right. For today's critical thought, we're going to be discussing the gameplay loop behind free-to-play and mobile games. This is in response to a news piece Polygon put out last week regarding the game Marvel Strike Force, which has players kind of rioting against some of the late-to-end game monetization and design practices of it. I've been playing the game myself. I am kind of like at the cusp of that end game, but I am, or I did beat the part where kind of the pain starts. And that's what I want to talk about, and kind of the major failing that comes with any free-to-play or mobile design that you need to be aware of when you're building your game out. Now, free-to-play and mobile games are always designed around a short-term core gameplay loop. It's not about 30 to 80 hours of gameplay. It's about 5 to 10 minutes of very focused design that you're going to enjoy, and then you're going to be done for the day, or done for a few hours. Then you're going to come back, and you're going to repeat this. And this is why, for so many free-to-play, and even the MMO genre itself, that was kind of the precursor, that the first 30 minutes to an hour of gameplay is going to be very engaging. This is how developers will hook players. As we've talked about when it comes to retail games, the first 15 to 30 minutes is a key part of engaging the player. And the same can be said of the free-to-play market. And what ends up happening, or what the one area where these developers excel at, is that short-term gameplay. This is why it's so interesting and so engaging to pick up a game like Clash Royale, uh, Clash of Clans, and so on and so forth, because they're designed to get you hooked quick and get you to keep coming back. And there's nothing wrong with that. And the best games around are designed around a very engaging short gameplay loop. This is why one of the big things that helped Doom 2016 work was that you're going to these monster arenas and you're only going to be fighting for two to five minutes, but it is going to be an extensive two to five minutes of hard fought combat. And there's nothing wrong there, and like I said, it works, and it works really well. The problem, though, and where we start to see the failing when it comes to free-to-play and mobile design, at least for the most part, is when we get to the mid to late game play. I don't want to say end game here, because most mobile and free-to-play games are not designed around an actual end game, as in you get here, and the game is done. As we've said, thanks to abstraction and abstractive based design, you can just keep padding and extending things out as long as you have numbers. You have a level cap of 60, let's just raise it to 70. Enemies too easy, let's give them 10,000 more points of health, and so on and so forth. But the problem with free to play and mobile design is that it is horrible when it comes to the long term investment. And again, we're talking about people who aren't just playing your game for 10 to 15 minute spurts. We're talking about people who have dozens, if not hundreds of hours of play, and they may even be treating your game as their core activity. So they may spend an hour to two hours a day playing your game, especially if we're talking about games with a PvP or competitive focus, like Clash Royale, South Park Phone Destroyer, and so on and so forth. But the problem is that this core gameplay loop is not engaging enough to sustain or excuse me to sustain that long term play. And before we get to some footage, I just want to briefly go over why. The first point is that a short term gameplay loop simply does not have the legs. When we talk about long term games like the buying of Isaac, Final Fantasy, or even games that have like 10 to 20 solid hours like Mario, Assassin's Creed, and so on, they are designed to be engaging from beginning to end. They know that there is, in, in a linear game, an endpoint. They know that my game starts here, and my hands are reversed here, but you get the picture, and we go to here, that everything in between should keep the player invested. If we're going to talk about roguelike or roguelite, that experience is designed to be procedurally or randomly generated enough to keep you coming back to finding new stuff. But in a free-to-play game, if you're only being designed around a 5-10 to 10 minute spurt of gameplay, that doesn't really afford a lot of growth or change. You're not going to be seeing something like a raid level content in an MMO in a free-to-play game like Clash Royale. 
you're not going to be seeing brand new heists and pre-playing like in Payday 2 that you would see in a game or it would be translated to a game like Marvel Puzzle Quest. The design is simply too narrowly focused to accommodate. And then the second point is with these games, because of that short-term focus, it makes it very hard to create new content. So what most developers will do is they will always have kind of like the pain point. That stretch of time where everything that kept the progress moving the player engage goes away. This is usually happens in the mid to the late gameplay. So if you have a level cap of let's say level 60, the pain point could occur around level 40 to 50, somewhere around that. And this is where the developer will try to make things as unpleasant as possible. If most of these games will feature resource spending to upgrade your character, well what will happen is let's say it progressively gets more expensive at a rate of 3% a level. Once you hit that pain point, it will become, let's say, 5%. Then you level up again, it will now become a 7% increase, then a 10%, then a 15%. And all this is designed is to slow down your progress as much as possible to either delay you from hitting their supposed endgame cap, or really push home the point that, hey, you got to spend some money now. You want progress? Give us $19.99. That PvP is a game too hard? Well, $50 and you'll get all the resources you need. Now, this creates a lot of issues with free-to-play design and especially what Marvel Strike Force is feeling. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any direct footage of that game. I'm not really set up for mobile streaming and recording. If there is enough interest and demand, I'll look into it, but let me know in the comments regarding that one. But we do have some footage that will pull up as some B-roll now. This is some footage of South Park Phone the Sir that I recorded, and this is just simply going to be B-roll. So you don't need to be watching this to keep track of what we're going to talk about. But when it comes to free-to-play design, and again, that long-term engagement, so many of these games have that struggle when it comes to properly having an endgame. This is more so felt in games without a true PvP component. And when we say PvP, we're not referring to two teams of Europe fighting against an AI of somebody else's team. We're talking about full-on, I'm fighting another player at the same time. And the reason is for many games, not just in the free-to-play space, but in multiplayer and MMO, this is why the end game is typically built on PvP content. Because as long as you have somebody else to play against, you will have a completely different experience. And this is what when I talk with Ramin about with the idea of user-generated content and being able just to keep your game prolonged so long as you have a community of people wanting to play it. And this is what keeps these games going when you don't need to be designing brand new levels and missions every two weeks. Now, when it comes to free-to-play and mobile design in general, the problem, though, is that when we get to that pain point due to either raising the values or slowing things down or just the forcedness of PvP, it becomes a lot harder to keep people motivated. It also means it's a lot harder to keep generating content. With Marvel Strike Force, I'm at level, I think, 59 right now. I think they have a cap of 65 or 70. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But the last 10 levels, the progression has been slower in 10 levels than it has been going from 1 to 49. And that's that pain point. The enemy stats have been raised, making it harder for me to progress. It's costing me more resources to get characters up to that point. And of course, I'm getting less rewards compared to when I first started. Anyone who's played a free-to-play game knows that in that first hour or two of play, you're going to be getting login rewards and bonus rewards and event rewards and so on and so forth. That's going to massively boost you up. And it sounds amazing in the beginning. If I have 700,000 gold and only cost me 1,000 to level up, 
And of course, I'm doing really well. But what happens when it now costs me 400,000 gold simply to level up one time? It's not going to be as engaging. And so many free-to-play games, again, struggle with keeping players invested. Because once we get to the late game, you really only have two options that don't piss people off. You either need to create original new content or gameplay systems, or you need to have something built around player engagement or community engagement. Now, while I was looking at Marvel Strike Force, there is going to be, or they've been planning this idea behind alliance raids, or aka guild battles, but it's not in the game yet. And that is a definitely a missing point when it comes to that end game. And I think why there's that pain point from level 50 to 60. Because once you hit the end cap, what's left to do? I don't think there is all that much. And this is why when we really talk about some of the best examples of free-to-play or games as a service, we see continued growth. Digital Extremes is probably the best example of this with Warframe, and not only how they've turned things around, but they've enhanced the game as well. It would have been so much easier for them to just simply take that same basic gameplay of like two to five minute long battles and just keep making more of those day in and day out. It would have, it would have been easier and less expensive, of course, but it would not keep the player base. And over the years, as anyone, I'm sure we have Warframe fans watching this right now, you know that they've added in quite a bit. They've changed their campaign structure. They've added in new resources. There's that whole new system of a quasi-open world exploration. I'm sure there's even more coming. But again, the point is, this is brand new stuff that is extending the life of the game. Payday 2 and Overkill is another minor example with new heists, the pre-planning system. Even the idea of just having a safe house that you can decorate and customize is new original content that's added. But here's my question for you folks. Can you think of a mobile free-to-play game that, ha that has had growth on that or even close to that same level as something like Warframe or Payday 2? And if you're about to mention Hearthstone, Hearthstone doesn't count because it was originally designed for the PC. I'm talking about an original mobile game that has seen that kind of games as a service long-term game design. Because I haven't found one yet, and it's going to be hard for these games to keep going. Now, before we wrap things up for this episode, there's one final point I want to touch on. It's a biggie. It is the R word when it comes to mobile and free-to-play games, and that is retention. How many people are continuing to play the game beyond just their initial play? Because this is the make it or break it for free-to-play design. It doesn't matter if you pulled in $5 million in revenue on your first month, if on the second month it drops down to $50,000. And when it comes to the mobile and free-to-play market, retention is vital for success. A few minutes ago when we mentioned competitive games, in the competitive scene this is all the more so because you are banking on people to be there to keep playing to supplement your end game content. This is what is kind of that downward spiral that we see in games like Lawbreakers and Evolve. That once people stop playing and your community is not growing, it's going to become harder for people to find games. And when that happens, they're going to stop playing as well, which makes it even harder. And then eventually, if your multiplayer-focused game doesn't have enough people playing to sustain the community, it's done. And there's no amount of additional content or quality of gameplay that's going to keep them coming back. And with the mobile scene, so many of the free-to-play games that we see on them, they like to boast record-breaking numbers, and, you know, we had a month of 5 million in sales, and our player base is expansive. But I'm always skeptical of that, because I want to see how this game is doing six months to a year from now. Are they able to remain or retain a consistent pool of players and profit? Because if they're not, then that 5 million in sales for one month doesn't mean anything. And I know that sounds very cynical, but it's the truth. 
if your game is costing again I don't, I'm just going to throw numbers out like $300,000 a month to keep going and keep developing it and you're not pulling in that money you might as well just forget it and this is why so many mobile free play games are trying to be as cost effective as possible because if they know that the chance of them having $10 million in revenue every month is not going to happen and the cheaper that you can keep your game maintained and growing ultimately means more profit for you because again, not, no, or I'm sorry, not every game is going to be the next Fortnite, or the next Hearthstone, or the next Clash Royale. But to wrap things up for our talk today, free to play and mobile design is so much front loaded in terms of player engagement and their short gameplay loop that it just, in many cases, leads to these games stalling out at the late game. And if you try to milk your fan base, or purposely install pain points to try and slow things down as with Marvel Strike Force's case, then people are going to know about and they're going to stop playing. And this is why, as a, from a design standpoint, if you're trying to build your game around a games-as-a-service model, then you need to be thinking about your end game. What are players going to go to? What's their end focus when the time comes? If you don't have an answer for that, you are going to have that problem. And if enough people quit, you may not have a time for a second chance. So my final question for you, for you watching this right now, can you think of games other than the ones we mentioned, like Warframe, that have done a great job in terms of having a sustainable and a growing endgame? Let me know in the comments below, but thanks for watching. If you'd like to suggest a topic for a future piece, let me know in the comments. But otherwise, check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. Before we get to the credits, just a quick shout out to the supporters over on patreon.com slash gwviser. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check back for our regular streaming most nights at 9.30, 10 EST and you'll find a schedule link down below. For a collection of my writings as well as audio casts on design, you'll find that at game-wisdom.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at GWBicer. If you're interested in hanging out and talking about game design topics, we have a Discord channel with the basic tier open to everybody, and that is linked down below as well. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, it is at patreon.com slash GWBicer. Your support can help to keep things going and growing, and you can earn rewards such as ad-free versions of our talks, votings for our specific Let's Plays and grab back streams, and more. But that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. I hope you come back for more great discussions on design here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games.